I don't have any food for you here today, but I do have a very different conversation. So yeah, I created a restaurant, which I never thought I would do in my life, but hopefully you'll understand um, that it does matter in the context of this conversation. Um, no, seriously, the first part of my career was in applied math, and I wrote textbooks and had an audience of about five people. I became involved in drug and vaccine delivery, um, inhaled insulin, uh, inhaled drugs and vaccine for diseases of poverty. And then for reasons I'll get into a little bit, became fascinated by this notion of opening up my lab to the public. It was something that was in the air at the moment. I published an article in uh, Nature in uh, 2006, and there were three articles that were published on this notion of opening up a lab to the public, one related to what I opened up in Paris. There was another one that opened up in London and one that opened up in Dublin. And why? So what's interesting, partly driven by some of the great sustainability challenges that we face today, uh, among other uh, phenomena today, there's this interest in very long-term research, which of course categorizes what scientists have done for a very long time, although much of the research agenda today is focused on a more nearer term kind of output. Uh, there's a real interest in this longer term research and one of the th factors which certainly characterizes what happened here today is that in doing long term research where outcome is 10, 20, 30 years out, we focus very much on the creation of forms and the expression of forms. We do, ex we have experiences. Uh, we very carefully observe uh, those experiences and express them in forms that share those experiences to those who kind of share our culture. And so if you look at the presentations today, we're, nobody was here demonstrating how to cure or even to treat Alzheimer's, but you all were expressing forms that were exchanging experiences that were profound for you, and therefore they became profound for us. And so that process is very similar to the process that led to this pretty amazing exhibition uh, that we, some of us saw last night at the Pivot Gallery next door, an artistic expression, very different than the scientific uh, exhibition that happened today, whose sort of uh, vertical uh, backbone is uh, logic. Uh, so uh, obviously an artistic uh, exhibition is not the scientific exhibition. But what fascinated me and many others is this notion that what we do has another form of expression, and that is an artistic form of expression. And so what's interesting about that is it opens up the possibility of a much broader dialogue around the kind of work that we do, the possibility of actually describing, exchanging, learning from experiences that we have that given the constraints of the scientific peer-reviewed process, we really can't articulate unless it's at a dinner like we had last night where we kind of exchange things uh, that we just can't really exchange with the public actually. Uh, in a world where in fact, the sustainability issues in health and the environment and society are not really fundamentally scientific. Uh, they are, to some degree, and technological, but they're also very much related to the public's willingness uh, to change behavior. And so not having the public in the dialogue is actually not healthy for us as creators, and it's really not healthy for the public, and it leads to all kinds of dysfunction. So I was interested in opening up my lab in that regard, and what I'd like to do in this presentation, there must be one of those, there we go. In, one, in this presentation, first spend about 10 minutes just creating a vocabulary that will hopefully convince you that what I'm describing here in this culture lab is very similar to what goes on in your own labs. I'd like then to talk about my own work uh, in these last 10 years and how this kind of lab has allowed me to translate uh, innovations that I wouldn't have been able to translate had I stayed in my uh, relatively conventional lab at Harvard University. And finally, then, I'd like to s talk about a number of contemporary art exhibitions that we've done and how we've been able to, or particularly artists have been able to articulate uh, experiences that I think we all have in our labs that are just hard to articulate. So uh, I'm not going to do this in French, but just to sort of make the point that in creating tomorrow, we all sort of accept that today is provisional. And there's a kind of a 
comfort with that notion in our labs that we're just constantly just dealing with the changing world. That's not something that's very in the streets, uh, but it's something we're all pretty comfortable with, this notion that the world is changing and what is true today is going to be modified tomorrow. And so this sort of joy uh, with the creative process is something that is inherent in what I'm going to show you, uh, perhaps a little bit more explicit than it is uh, in our labs, but I think it's fundamental to what we do. So we all uh, are moved by different kinds of observations, and it guides us to do the research, hopefully, that we do. I, in this first 10 minutes, will refer to my experiences in Africa, uh, where I began to work in the early 2000s in the context of a Gates Grant Challenge Grant, uh, looking at inhaled vaccine for TB. And I uh, wandered. <laughs> into the kitchen of William. So I was sort of fascinated by the fact that the issues of water that I was aware of in Boston, Massachusetts, uh, were not William's issues. Actually, William had access to water. But it's just that the water that he got from the fountain became filthy when it sat in his kitchen. And so it sort of really struck me. So that, as an illustration of my uh, zebrafish, um, uh, is something that struck me. And so we make observations. And from those observations, we go back into our lab and we dream. So we create labs that allow us to sort of create this reality that exists in our lab. This is an image from a film that will be, uh, it's a first animated scent film that I'll describe a little bit later that we'll be uh, showing in New York in uh, later April, which may seem very frivolous, but I'll come back to this later. But there is this dream that happens in, in our labs. We do some experimentation, and we create forms. Uh, those forms create a kind of a dialogue. And those, di those forms and that dialogue are typically not related to uh, treating Alzheimer's. They're kind of a step in that direction. Uh, in this kind of a lab, the peer is not the sort of peers that are in this room, but is a much broader public. In this particular case, we developed a kind of a, uh, what we call the cell bag, a kind of a gourd that allowed parents to go search for water and bring it back and kids to carry it to school and not for the water to get dirty without getting into it. That's not the solution to the water problem in uh, sub-Saharan Africa by any means, but it was a step in that uh, direction and uh, it was part of that process. This kind of uh, experimentation where we take the process that's happening in our labs and we bring it to a, a very form-based kind of cultural process is much more accessible to young people and therefore it's relevant to education. So I'm not going to talk about education here, but just to say that what I teach at Harvard and in some other programs outside of Harvard, we're really interested in helping students learn not to how, to, how to become a lawyer or a doctor or a uh, film producer, but actually how to create the profession of law or medicine or, say, film production when they leave, right? And so in a world that's constantly changing, it really doesn't make as much sense for me to be teaching uh, my students how to be what I was yesterday, but we're trying to give them this ability to uh, learn while learning to make tomorrow. So it becomes relevant. Uh, the kinds of things we try and teach Students are sorts of things that all of you as uh, PIs and, and leaders in your labs have learned uh, over time. I'm sure you didn't learn it in school in a classical way, but these are qualities of passion, empathy. You think that maybe that's, that's so important. Um, this study that came out from Google recently was sort of getting to that. Daring innocence, this day was pretty reflective of that. Actually, you were all sort of not giddy, but more giddy than I'd see at a normal scientific conference, because you're all sort of doing what you're not normally doing, actually. And that's something that all of us as creative people, we're trying to get to these places where, with all of our experience, we can be innocent again, because discovery comes always in this state of innocence, which is a vulnerable state. And so you're really vulnerable to information. And you need to know how to be selective in grabbing the information. This is a pretty curated room. Uh, so selectivity, humility, we all fail constantly at frontiers and being able to learn from that failure. Aesthetically aware, we talk a lot about engineering uh, intelligence, uh, technical intelligence, uh, but actually aesthetic intelligence is extremely important in uh, the translation or the creation of what has not existed before. And obsessive perfectionism, which you all know really well. So the arc here is that we begin with 
impressions, this another impression that got me in the middle 2000s, we really were sure that the major healthcare issues in the developing world are, of course, infectious disease. But as relative affluence came to Africa, we began to see cardiovascular disease and depression and other kinds of diseases that we're more familiar with and maybe more uh, able to defend ourselves against. Uh, so these mounds of trash began to grow outside of major cities like Johannesburg and uh, began to drive home the fact that actually just how we eat is a major health um, and environmental challenge. And so we make these observations. We do experiments uh, and we express those experiments. So I'm going to be showing you lots, and it's all related to this idea that what we do uh, in aesthetic theory is called aesthetics, actually. This is an aesthetic experience that we have. There's a book, a uh, fascinating book for any of, one of you who are interested in this uh, by John Dewey called uh, Art as Experience, which is highly relevant to this conversation. Um, and therefore, in this lab, and I'm done with the preamble, but just to say in this lab, we do every six months experiments, ex exhibitions are kind of like our publications. Uh, this, uh, the last one we did was around ocean um, biodiversity and involved the contemporary artist Mark Dion working with the marine biologist Lisa Ann Gershwin and, uh, and exploring uh, jellyfish blooms in the ocean, which doesn't look like we're doing that here, but it's an ex artistic exhibition, which was really uh, quite fascinating. It leads to public dialogue uh, much earlier than it would in the scientific context where we're trying to get through the peer-reviewed process and really be sure uh, in this kind of a lab we're talking about many things that we're not really that sure about. Maybe we can't be that sure about because the conditions are so evolving uh, or just not so clear. This was a work that we did when we opened the laboratory here in Cambridge. In Cambridge. We did a project around with uh, Todd Macover, a composer, and Neri Oxman exploring vibrations, voice vibrations, and, and how those vibrations might impact cellular health. And it, involved creating forms that externalized vocal vibrations in various ways. So it was really quite an interesting uh, conversation. We typically have in these projects lots of student learning and uh, this uh, happened to be one of the projects where kids were actually walking through showers of uh, beef turkey and other things that were falling on their heads as they were exploring this notion of what does space mean. And this is students from the Graduate School of Design Space in this um, world that we uh, live in. So that's a very high um, level view of the Culture Lab. What I'd like to do now is dive into a couple of my research projects in this lab and how they've been translated into uh, sustainable uh, interventions, uh, both related to uh, how we eat and the environment and human health. So uh, this is the lab and it's in Kendall Square uh, eight, uh, a few minutes from the uh, tea stop and um, we did an experiment. So back in 2010, I was really interested in this issue of plastic and food and was sort of struck that it should be possible to make food and beverage packaging like nature makes fruit. So we should be able to cr create skins and shells that are edible and yet um, um, stable. Uh, and we should be able to capture all of the benefits that pl plastic packaging has given us and then get rid of many of the liabilities that we've sort of discovered in the last 10 years. And so we did an, I did an experiment with a French uh, designer and artist, uh, Francois Azenbourg, and uh, we uh, began to explore this, figured out how to do it. Uh, which basically you can make these skins like you, you know, nature makes the stra stratum corneum. So you have uh, electrostatically gelled membranes uh, with things that we're all familiar with, chitosan and, and uh, polysaccharides. And then you, food particles that are charged kind of become sort of like the keratinocytes. And then you have calcium or magnesium. And then you can layer them. So that's the trick of the stratum corneum is you have these layers of uh, keratinocytes and, uh, and then the layers give the water and gas impermeability that allows us really to be packaging. So you can make yogurt uh, grapes that uh, are stable for a couple months in, in the refrigerator and so forth. But initially when we did this actually we were sure that this was all about the environment. But then I don't have time to get into all the detail but it was pretty laughable what happened. Of course people eat it and, and that is like it's food. Nobody thinks about 
like an apple as being packaged by an apple skin. It's just like an apple, right? And so people, it had to be really good. And so the issue was, well, you, now you figured out how to eliminate plastic from packaging, but who cares, right? People go to the store to get food, right? And so they want to help the world, but they especially want to eat. And so how do you make these things so that people really want them? So we spent a few years uh, in experimentation. And finally, uh, this last fall, um, a, uh, First product line is launched in about 60 stores, uh, Star Market and things like that around Boston. It's selling really well. It's scaling to about 1,000 stores this spring. And it, what's interesting is that people are not buying this to say, hey, we eliminate plastic packaging. They're buying it because there's no, none of the eight major food allergens. It's a coconut-based ice cream. It tastes really good, and it's 30 calories. And um, so that's the first line. We have. Uh, next month, it turns out you can make any fruit in the form of a grape. So kids, believe it or not, are not eating fruit anymore because it's too complicated, right? It's like the, who brings the pineapple to school? Um, and parents are worried about the skins, so we're remaking the skins. And you can make like a banana as a grape or a um, you know a cherry, blueberry, orange, uh, whatever you want. And uh, these are about five calories. Uh, they taste really good, and kids really love them. And so this is coming out here. Um, now, you can make a water bottle, and uh, this is ultimately why we started this project, and, uh, but it really involves a major change in consumer behavior. And so we, you make it like a coconut. So the coconut is the best water bottle we have. Uh, cu cut it, take it, send it around the world. You open it up, you've got coconut water. Um, so you have this white endoderm. Uh, so we make that, as I kind of described. Uh, and then you, you can make a shell that is uh, edible, but you basically, it's really a sacrificial layer. You kind of toss it into, the, into nature. That's what it looks like. So that looks like it fell off of uh, the, uh, like a, a comet going over the um, uh, earth. Uh, but it, it, you know, this is really not designed yet for consumer. You can clearly make it so that you can tear off a piece of it. But basically, the shell is zen, which is corn protein. You can eat it, but it tastes like dried corn chip. Uh, but you sort of peel it off bite it, drink it, and it's stable at room temperature for a couple months. Um, now, that's just such a dramatic change in consumer behavior that where we're at with that, we've signed a deal with the uh, Two Oceans Marathon, which runs between the two oceans around Cape Town to eliminate water, it's like plastic from water sachets in the race. Um, it's that kind of use that it can make sense for in a sports use, like a one-time use. Uh, but this gets to the point of really changing and creating sustainability uh, often uh, requires a change in consumer behavior. And so it's sort of a, a co-creation. Um, I'd like to spend uh, more time here on my interest and in, in the relevance of this lab to healthcare. Um, there's a lot of interest, as you know, in medicine right now and moving healthcare from illness to wellness, from hospital to um, the phone and, and your, your pocket uh, for lots of reasons. Um, and in that regard, I've been interested in this notion of, um, well, initially I was really interested in this notion of hacking the senses. One of the big problems of healthcare relates to the fact that we have food, we have drugs. But many of the excesses and health problems come from the fact that we're interested in sensations. And so we are uh, overdosing ourselves on food and, and drugs frequently because we're interested in the sensations they give, not really because we want the caloric uptake or the medication. And so how do you deliver sensations uh, and liberate people from uh, the, um, the other stuff? So we did some experimentation. This was with Philippe Stark, who's a uh, French designer. And we created this little thing called the WA, which was, this is an exhibition where in this, um, I'm not sure how to do that, but in this, in this uh, little thing here, a little capsule comes out. You have this little, very small amount of liquid with really strong taste. And it could have uh, different kinds of things, like alcohol. And you spray it. You have 40 micrograms in your mouth. So it's like a very, very infinitesimal amount. But you get this really strong taste of sensation. So it was an early experiment. We made larger. Um, objects that you could pour any liquid into, and ultrasound creates this cloud. It's not a vapor. It falls by gravity into a glass, and you can drink it. Uh, major chefs using it around the world. And so this was all early on, but really what then came to us, uh, and I began to work with a student of mine, Rachel Field, uh, with this idea of digitizing scent. So ultimately, vape, you know, odor, scent 
is a uh, kind of the one of the three sensations that travel through the air that has not been digitized. Light, sound, scent, uh, light, sound, energy, scent, mass, lots of interest in the past in integrating scent into communications and digitizing it. Um, medicine has become really interested in scent, and you should all know because one of the major reasons of cognitive degenerative disease and the connection between my scent sensitivity and my um, uh, loss of brain function. Uh, I'm going to get back to that here in a second, but there was this movement um, here over the last several years that I kind of got caught up into related to scent and the power that scent has. The only uh, sensory nerve with direct access to our brain is the olfactory nerve. We, um, we uh, emotively experience uh, scent in a way before we cognitively do, if you will. Uh, we can cry, we can uh, remember, uh, we can get hungry before we quite know uh, what has hit us. So the power of scent is, is very clear. One of the problems with scent is that uh, you go olfactory f deaf after about five or 10 minutes in a scent cloud. So while we go into a room, you turn on the lights, you turn on the sound, uh, you don't really turn on the scent. And if you do, it, uh, you, you, you kind of lose sight of it or you can't smell it anymore about after five or 10 minutes. So it's like the lights going off after you kind of walk into the room. So if you want scent to work for you, it is not as simple as a, uh, you've got the platform, I've got a speaker of scent, fill the room with scent. There's a, you need to deliver just enough scent to give the signal. And uh, anyway, so we uh, did an exhibition and then we're invited to London for a Wired conference and we decided to do an experiment where we, I gave this talk to about 500 people and we said, okay, here's an app and you can all go and create a virtual coffee concert. And so you had coffee, chocolate, caramel, and nut, and you had four movements. And so you chose what you wanted, and then you sent it to this app, and then you came to this virtual coffee bar, and you could smell your creation. So everybody did it, it crashed the app, and so then we got that up, and they came, and they had this experience. The first person who came uh, had no hair. And so he walks up, and I, I can't smell anything. And so, I, of course, wondered why I hadn't thought that that might happen. Uh, of course, we have big variants in scent sensitivity. Anosmic uh, um, uh, is maybe 10%, but it's a significant amount of the human population. Uh, so, but he kept coming back over and over again. And so it was a young man who had had a, an accident and had lost memory and was getting memory back. And scent was part of him getting memory back. And the notion that he could program tomato soup and then go smell tomato soup was somehow very important to him. And so that led me to believe early on, while we were focused on digitizing scent to make it possible, any video, any email, any website, not only get light sound, but to have scent, there was a real healthcare opportunity here. So we uh, have done a couple years of experimentation, really public, and are now just um, doing a uh, launch April 27th in New York of this, um, it's a scent speaker. And, um, I'm going to uh, demo it here for you, actually, but um, just to say that um, the, the, the way this will be used initially uh, is for creating your personal space. You put it in your car in the cup holder, and it plays scent music. And so the scents evolve over time, so you remain conscious of them, and they're designed to empower and to relax, to help you escape and to kind of create your um, personal space as scent, by the way, the oldest industry is fragrance, but here it becomes digitized. Uh, but then it becomes then a, a platform for any kind of uh, scent um, media. So in this context, uh, while at this restaurant that uh, uh, Tom mentioned, it's called Cafe Art Science, uh, I'll show you a few pictures here. But uh, I was uh, working, and Denny Ocielo, who is head of was a head of medicine at uh, MGH, uh, and uh, stepped down a couple years ago, and is um, uh, you know an amazing uh, both uh, medical scientist, entrepreneur, and had just he was the main consultant behind the Apple Health app, which when it came out about a month later, he came, he was there for an Al Island board meeting and came up to me and said, "We need to talk olfaction." And so that led to uh, several months. Uh, we ended up going out to Mountain View and talking about uh, how a clinical study that uh, Denny and his team at Ketch at MGH uh, have designed, which basically involves taking uh, lots of uh, uh, metabolic and other kinds of 
uh, data and measuring scent variation. And why, so yes, there's a really amazing correlation between cognitive degenerative disease and scent sensitivity. So as I, uh, two years before I have shaking motion and Parkinson's, I've lost uh, uh, measurable scent sensitivity. Um, similar effects in Alzheimer's, uh, autism, and so forth, but it's not specific, right? And so it turns out also before you eat, you're more sensitive than after you eat, before you have diabetes than after you have diabetes. Your set sensitivity varies in the day, the week, your life. And so how to be specific? Well, if we knew how to be specific, then an Apple Health app would not have the problem of not having data in it because we could actually have among the different uh, pieces of information that your phone is collecting when you get up and all kinds of stuff, it would, by memory games and other things, have data that is um, indicative of your biochemical state and, um, and therefore potentially be helpful to um, apps like the health, uh, Apple Health App. Anyway, so we uh, then have, through many conversations, ended up, Richard Doty, so the canonical test right now for scent diagnostics uh, is the UPSIT, developed at UPenn. About 500,000 people have used it. Over 100 studies have been published with it. And uh, we're digitizing that right now with, uh, with Richard and, um, and preparing a clinical study to compare a number of different tests with the digitization uh, test with the idea then uh, following the study, if it, if it confirms the um, kind of the bridging, uh, we would then uh, be able to do really massive studies and collect the data uh, needed. So um, yes, there's a really interesting therapeutic opportunity and so forth, but this uh, diagnostic opportunity is really central to, I think, um, what you're probably very passionately interested, but also a much broader um, uh, movement in, in healthcare. Um, so in a way, the bar became a uh, forum for peer review. So I, we had a conversation last night about um, well, you know, Carl Sagan we were talking about and the sort of public intellectual and, you know, where has that gone? And I think what's happening is that the public fora are really generalizing. So it's no longer just TV and radio and it's definitely no longer the one kind of one-way one communication uh, that we're um, familiar with in school and museums and on TV, but it's a much more of a dialogue and uh, the... Uh, introduction of uh, uh, art um, in not only uh, a formal contemporary art way, but also culinary art and so forth into uh, the uh, creative process uh, in the scientific process opens up the uh, conversation. Um, so we created this cafe next to the lab uh, where it's a restaurant, but we also do quite a bit of experimentation. And some of these things that I'm describing that wouldn't really belong in a, in a kind of a standard um, CVS or a store where you would normally get um, maybe products like these uh, can exist in a sort of um, suspended uh, uh, reality um, yeah, where we're living a future uh, before it's, it's, uh, it's kind of there. So um, I'd like to spend the last uh, 10 minutes um, talking about what you do and, and how you might um, think about what you do more broadly in a cultural lab context and, and maybe, if only, think differently about what you do by looking at what um, these experiments have done. So this is the lab in, in, in uh, Paris, and I'm going to just walk through a number of um, experiments that have happened over the last years, and, and um, some of them are kind of funny, some of them are super serious, uh, and, and hopefully um, you will think a little bit differently about what you do. So a first experiment we did was, of course, this was very early on, so I was pretty nervous about what this really meant to have a lab, actually. And it was right in the center of Paris, and everybody was going to say, well, what is this? And, um, and uh, people were also saying, who would come? And I, of course, had no idea who would come. But it seemed like a good thing to do. Uh, we had a very well-known artist, Fabrice Hibert, who um, I brought to MIT. And Bob Langer was an advisor of mine at MIT. and. Uh, Fabrice had made this, um, this painting. Uh, this is another version of it, but the, it, it had apples falling from the tree and then becoming grapes. And this was a, re, his own reflection on the immigration problem in France. And uh, he asked me if we could kind of make that. And I said, well, if you accept that the apples are uh, stem cells and the 
um, and the grapes are neurons, we can do that. So he felt like that was interesting. And he came to MIT to kind of look at research going on in that regard. And what came out of this was an experience, right? And so basically, there is a catwalk, oops, sorry. There's a catwalk um, that is up here. And uh, the public was invited, of course, this happened very rarely, but was invited to jump into this. So this was a PLA uh, tube uh, that you could, in principle, jump through. And as you did, um, I'm sorry, um, as you did, uh, these beads went up. And so you had this sort of interesting moment here in the center where you were sort of, sort of cut um, in. I'm not sure what's happening here. Uh, oh, so oops. Uh, does somebody want to help me here? What? Uh, so there was his, the notion here was to give, and, and then you ultimately came out through the bottom and fell on a mattress, and there's this notion of having the experience of cellular division, which of course um, uh, would be something you'd never forget. Um, this, so we do all do exploratory work, right, that we'll never publish, but we're sort of just exploring. And there's really no forum to kind of share that, actually. And so this... Um, Thank you. Uh, we did an experiment with uh, James Noctway, who's the photographer, the, was the main photographer of the Time Magazine, kind of leading war photographer of our day. Uh, people asked me, well, we understand why uh, scientists could help artists, but could artists really help scientists? And so uh, Anne uh, is a professor at the medical school and runs a clinic, an AIDS clinic in Cambodia, and described an experience of James coming to the clinic and with his camera and she seeing the camp through his eyes, she changed how she ran the clinic. And that really moved me and we ended up doing an experiment, they did, around um, AIDS and TB clinics um, in the world and looking at this connection between caregivers and, and the dying. Uh, it was a very painful kind of exhibition, very not uh, well attended. Uh, but it ended up tra tr leaving and going to Bangkok for one of the Gates Grand Challenge meetings and led to a really incredibly emotive uh, moment, which if anybody's interested, we can talk later about. But this, there are things that we do that are poignant um, and, again, are difficult um, to uh, describe in the normal um, scientific peer-reviewed um, context. Pro provocation is something that we're really not um, invited to do uh, in other than very subtle ways. Uh, Shilpa Gupta is a contemporary artist based in Mumbai, uh, very, um, was very interested in this notion of political terror and where, why does it happen actually? And we paired her with Mazarin Banerjee, who is a neuroscientist and psychologist at Harvard, very interested in the unconscious mind, um, has worked with Malcolm Gladwell on his first book and all of that. And, um, and so it led to this pretty amazing work, which came out two months after the Mumbai attacks she, she was kind of involved in. Um, and this here is called the Singing Cloud, and there's like 5,000 microphones. Uh, and as you walk in, voices are coming out of those. It's her voice and lots of other sounds. And, the, and, the, and it runs around this cloud. And, and it's really incredibly poetic. And Mazarin came into this exhibition and you know, said, I've, I've, I've now seen the unconscious mind. The notion of Shilpa was to give voice to this sort of uh, voiceless uh, majority. And um, this was then purchased by the Louisiana Museum outside of Copenhagen and is, was a very both provocative and really moving um, exhibit. Um, l much of, there are moments when we are in a celebratory mode Again, difficult to communicate, important for the public to see that actually experimenting with the future is fun. You know, fun in a sort of masochistic way that we all know, but it's fun. And that kind of joy, uh, we did a project with William Kentridge, who's one of the leading artists living today, who is based in Johannesburg. And I went to see him, and, and are you interested in a frontier? He's interested in time and the notion of now. Uh, and obviously was a real big issue in the late 19th century. and. Uh, formative to Einstein's revolution, uh, but has become, again, uh, relevant in a different way given the way we live today. And so I, uh, he was about to do an opera in New York, uh, Shostakovich's Nose, and I introduced him to Peter Gallison, who's a colleague of mine at Harvard, and it led to 
an exhibition that around uh, called the Rivers of Time. It was just an amazingly moving and uh, celebratory project that then has gone on to be an opera that has that travels around the world uh, and um, explores with the public uh, this complex and sometimes very uh, stressful notion of time. So I would really like to leave you with this notion that there is possibly a parallel research process to what you all do and we do in our labs that is uh, especially designed for other kinds of problems um, that can lead to a public, public dialogue uh, that at a time when um, the world is changing very rapidly and uh, a significant amounts of the public um, are not participating in that and are anxious about that is not only positive for the public, but for all of us who are interested in our ideas going out and really changing the world, um, we need everybody uh, to be part of this and there's a lot of learning uh, to be had in this kind of a, um, a lab um, and in creating uh, to matter. So that's my talk. Thank you very much and thank you all for your talks. <laughs>
there's a uh, Bluetooth connection, a little computer, and a motor, and, and a fan. And, and so there's uh, four fragrances per uh, capsule. And then there's, uh, as I say, coconut or walnut or whatever, there's a little hole that kind of spins under these chips and blows the air through the particular. Um, are, are you doing it? Yeah, I just got the email. OK, well, this is. All right, sorry. This is sort of anticlimactic, but it's, uh, it's sort of, it, it will happen. Um, is it playing? It's playing. Look at that. And what? So it, is that? It's it's so it's serious. And in, in, in Seattle's pretty funny. It turns out. All right. So. So yeah. So um, I, you can play with this uh, later if that's interesting to you. Um, what's you know, the, the, the technology here is really, we can talk more about it, but um, the idea of miniaturization, the idea of being able to make something that's uh, cheap and inexpensive and, and can be, um, and can be uh, uh, you know, uh, can create a really vast, um, it, unfortunately, scent is not like color. We have three basic colors. There's about 800, uh, really a couple thousand, but down to 800 cents kind of make up everything. Uh, so can I ask you a question? Yes. May I? Please. So you you talk about um, your concept of bringing these ideas to the public. Yeah, this is not running anymore, so there, there, this is there is a blatant smell. So maybe you need to bring this back, and we'll do this. It needs to be connected. He, uh, you, you know, Tom is not really paying attention. So if you just bring this back up, and we can kind of, and we can, you can show. We'll show you how it works up here. Actually, sorry about that. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So what's your concept of the public out there? Who? Who are you trying to bring this to? Uh, you know, the public yeah. is a, it's vast. a yeah. large amorphous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, it's going to appeal to certain and not yeah. others. Yeah. What's so, so your it, concept of And that? so there's a sort of so self-selectivity. So this is definitely not. Uh, so in fact, um, this is an invitation. And, and so now I've done it in Paris. I've done it in Cambridge. And um, let me take a little bit of an analogy. So you're writing a book, or it could be anything else that you're doing. And in the very early stages, you have a mate or somebody who you sort of share. Somebody. And so initially, there's a very, the intimacy is really important. And you sort of expand that out to maybe some friends, then an agent, and then there's ultimately an editor, and then there's critics. And you kind of go out bigger and bigger and bigger. And in a non-peer-reviewed, sort of intuitively figure out who can you trust and how to and actually, in, Bringing our ideas out, learning how to do that without peer review and figuring out intuitively who can you share with and who not is important. So what happens to curate the audience? So the audience really matters. We're not catering to the audience, really. We're actually doing a true experiment and sort of saying, may anyone who's interested come? And we design, really, the space and the language and the um, experiments to really not appeal to many, actually. It's very quite an intimate sort of experience. And what we found in Cambridge and in Paris are that these are there's a young generation and an old generation, but there's a real generation that doesn't really uh, see culture anymore as we used to think of culture and is actually much more comfortable with the ambiguous, much, is much more comfortable going into an exhibition and coming out not really understanding, okay, that's the message I was to get. And so they're interested in kind of coming to frontiers. So initially, it's that kind of a curious, um, as, as uh, my friend in London at the Welcome Collection, is a kind of another lab like ours, calls them the incurably curious. Uh, so there's this group of people that uh, given the nature of the world today, is there. And, uh, and then, you know, our restaurant actually goes one more sort of orbit out. And so there, we're saying, anybody wants a really good restaurant, but know that an experiment can happen. And so that's actually, a lot of people want to eat food, and they kind of um, are OK with a little bit of experimentation. Food is a really interesting environment for experimentation. Is really quite an audience for that. Um, so this is part of the art of changing the world, is kind of figuring out how do you do it um, and, 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 and kind of learn enough from that first orbit to be different at the second orbit. And by the time you're at the outer orbit, you've changed completely, right? And, and, and it's now kind of a public um, thing. And we've done it super wrong. Uh, in, going back, I came from the kind of biotech environment where you needed FDA approval. And, and it's the best technology, best patent, and, and, and it works. And you show it works in the FDA, and then a medical doctor uh, subscribes it, and the pharmacy sells it. And so it's kind of, but in a non-regulated environment, you, it's really not about the smartest person in the room. It's really about 
humility and about listening and about lots of things that um, I think we all know in our intimate groups, but it becomes much more relevant to figuring out the audience. So one could make an argument that what the world really needs is uh, anti-scent. <laughs> You've been to Africa and there are millions of children who get malaria from Aedes aegypti carrying the malaria organism. Yeah. And uh, they, they zero in on our carbon dioxide and pheromones that a humans uh, if, if you yeah. have a little machine. The pheromones like are not really, yeah, the pheromones right. don't really, uh, they kind well, of exist in insects. But anyway, there, what is true is that um, the vapor that our bodies put off are, uh, you know, is detected and, and can be a vector for um, disease for sure. Um, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a sense of scent, period. You know, scent is incredibly fundamental to how your, your eyes matter, your, sound, your, your, your nose totally matters. Um, we used to, up to, uh, you know, there's some amazing books on the subject, but up until the 19th century, really, we were surrounded by a profoundly aromatic world, and so there was all kinds of mysticism, actually, around scent. Once we figured it out, a couple centuries where we were really um, sort of designing our uh, spaces with scent, and we continue to have sort of micro, that's true in the digital world, we're kind of, uh, we sort of um, are not used to being touched, we're not used to being smelling, and, and, and uh, you know, many of the um, Epicurean kind of senses are not really being, and is that good for healthy living and wellness? There's a big consensus that probably not. Uh, now, how do you bring scent back into the world. You don't go back to the 18th century Paris, for sure. And so what do you do? So the fascinating thing is that from a s medical science point of view, uh, we're understanding every year, as much as we're understanding the brain, we're understanding olfaction and how it works, and understanding its profound connection to emotive state and to you know, satiety and all kinds of things. Um, so using scent intelligently um, is, is a really um, important thing, which is not to say that foul smells are welcome and we should all have more of them. There are negative things with light and sound and scent for sure. But um, there's a real movement, um, whether you're at Google or whether you're at Apple, whether the scent is now becoming quite a, uh, um, and not to mention that there's just whole parts of the economy that are not digitized, right? That are actually fundamentally connected to scent as part of the value proposition. And if you go into the store, you get it, but if you're online, you don't. And so our ability to, um, so both from an industry point of view, a health point of view, and, a, uh, and there is this movement finally in immersive, as we go more and more immersive digitally, the absence of those other senses is just really remarkable. And so people are asking for that to happen too. But we need to do it right, for sure. Anyway, next time you go to New York, there's a gal, Dr. Leslie Vassall, who's trying to engineer genetically mosquitoes so they don't detect human pheromones. That's super yeah. cool. That's super cool. OK, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. <laughs>